I wanted to move into the bourgeois revolution in textile technology. And uh, I want to start out with going back to the Poor Relief Act of 1662. Remember, that was a revision of the Poor, Poor Relief Act of 1601, something like that. And then of course there's a, an act in the time of Elizabeth. And so, <clears throat> or actually the 1601 is, is the act from uh, Elizabeth. That's at the end of her reign. And we see that this becomes more of a thing. The, the you know, uh, England in the 20th century is known as a welfare state that uh, goes back to these poor relief laws going all, all the way back to the Elizabethan period. Um, now the Poor Relief Act of 1662 made it so that you could only get poor relief from the parish in which you were born or to which you were belonged in some way or another. And, um, and this also reflects the fact that the poor relief had devolved from the central government down to the level of parishes. A parish is the jurisdiction of a particular Anglican uh, 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 a particular Anglican church building uh, community and and so that's the way that it was organized. And that's very similar to the organization within uh, Catholic communities. So this parish system is a holdover from Roman Catholicism. And let's remember that Newton wrote the uh, Mathematica Principia, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy in 1687. And then, uh, and then just a generation later, later, we have the Newcom Atmospheric Engine. And that is something that's very similar to a steam engine. Uh, it's just not quite as efficient. And, and the Newcom is the name of the guy, I can't remember his first name, but but he invented this engine uh, to work with coal mines in particular to pump water out of the coal mines. And of course, coal mines have an abundance of coal. And so he used that uh, you know, resource that was readily available in any coal mine to create this engine that would then pump water out of the lower depths of the mine, uh, because this is a constant issue when you're when you're uh, digging a mine, you know, you're gonna get water building up in the lower portions and, and that makes work uh, difficult, if not impossible at times. Um, okay, and then the workhouse test in 1723. So this is, this is just as uh, George the first is uh, on the throne in England and then we have this workhouse test, uh, which says, and, and this is a modification of the Poor Relief Act of 1662. It says that somebody who wants to receive poor relief, to receive money uh, from the government to help them out with their basic needs, must enter the workhouse to receive indoor relief. Um, and indoor here means receiving it in the workhouse. Outdoor relief would be receiving it, it like in home at wherever they happen to live. So maybe the little reverse to the way we might think about it, but that's, that's the way it's worded at this time. And that just continues throughout actually. <clears throat> what this seems to indicate is that a high number of able-bodied people are seeking poor relief that um, there is this idea that these people could work 
And so since they can work, we're going to make them work in the workhouse. We're going to make a workhouse and we're going to find work for them to do. And when they do that work, then they can receive relief. So it's like uh, government employment, uh, you know, we'll find something to employ them with. Uh, this was generally not successful and ultimately parishes just in practice re resort to outdoor or what we would call in-home relief. Um, and this seems to be a regular feature of welfare programs, even in the United States up to this day. Uh, President Clinton was famous for, you know, trying to attack the welfare queen and, and uh, he's had a welfare to work program. Uh, and maybe you're not familiar with the welfare queen trope, but uh, there's this idea that there's these, these wealthy uh, African-American, this is a stereotype, African-American women that are super wealthy and collecting welfare checks on fictitious children for fictitious reasons and just raking in all this dough and living the life uh, off of the welfare system. This is something that was popular in the time of George H.W. Bush before Clinton uh, and even at the tail end of the Reagan administration. Um, and so what Clinton does is he, uh, he creates a program called, called welfare to work which means that people had to work in order to receive welfare, but it just caused all sorts of follow-on um, prob problems. You know, it's it's a it's a recipe for for disaster and in ineffectiveness, and and everyone should know this uh, because that's what happened in 1723. Okay, um, uh, just just check your history, see. You know, does that work? Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, well, maybe come up with a different idea. <clears throat> but that's not, you know, that would be a scientific approach, not a political approach. Um, okay, so um, now we get into the specific technology. That, that, that workhouse stuff will come up uh, a little later on. But I just want to lay the groundwork and I put everything in chronological order and then I'll just tie things together. It's like these, all these kind of loose ends and then I just keep tying them together, tying them together, tying them together. Um, so Basil Bouchon invents um, a perforated tape control for the draw loom. So the draw loom, as I mentioned, uh, is a relatively ancient technology from 400 BC requires two people to run it. And one of the people is like the weaver, like we saw the, the woman who was using the backstrap um, loom. She would be the weaver, okay? And, and in this contraption, which is hard for me to describe, but uh, there would be the weaver who's like on the front end of it, I would say. Um, and they're doing something very similar to what uh, that woman with the back uh, strap loom was doing, uh, sending the weft through and tamping down. But then there's the draw boy on the back side of the, the apparatus who's actually picking out individual strands of the warp you know, in a systematic fashion to create a design that is, is uh, something different from just a standard warp and weft like we saw in that diagram, which is just basic. It creates, you know, this unique sort of pattern. And then the draw boy has to have that skill to pick these out and, and there's a mechanism for doing that. Okay. Um, so what uh, Bouchon does is he creates using just strips of paper with holes punched into them and then uh, an elaborate mechanism that goes with that. The holes would indicate which strings are to be pulled and the mechanism that he created would read the holes in the paper and then pull those particular strings of the warp so that you get the complicated pattern. 
uh, Jean Baptiste Falcon, uh, he refines that using uh, square tube cardboard. Uh, so like a square tube elongated uh, with holes through it, which I can imagine probably makes it a little more durable. Uh, that's probably the main thing. And uh, that seemed to be an improvement. Uh, Jacques de Vacanson um, around this time uh, creates uh, Android table waiters. So he's gonna come up a little later, but he actually created something where it actually uh, appeared uh, to the people at a dinner, you know, and he would put on these shows for wealthy people and, and they would be served their dinner by androids, what we would imagine as androids and they're just mechanical waiters that had human features and everything like that. There were sculptures, but they would actually, they had me mechanical articulations like animatronics at Disneyland to uh, serve your food. And uh, so this is the kind of, you know, inventiveness that's going on at the time, uh, very much inspired by um, Isaac Newton's, you know, Newtonian physics, suddenly everybody's like, okay, this totally makes sense. And you can do things on paper, you know, you can actually work things out on paper and have a pretty good idea of how they're going to work out. So you, it's not as much trial and error as it might have been in earlier decades. Okay, so uh, now here is a big turning point. And if you watch the video, from earlier of that I told you to watch at the end of the, the uh, video on primitive and traditional textile technology. If you watch that video, you'll see a demonstration of the, the fly shuttle where instead of sending it through by hand, there's like this strap and a little handle and you just kind of click it, it throws it, you tamp it down, click it, it throws it, tamp it down and it just speeds up the process tremendously. Um, I wouldn't know exactly, I think one of the people in the video asked, actually asked uh, the guy demonstrating it how much faster it would be, but I would estimate, and he didn't know, but I would estimate that it'd be at least three times faster and maybe much more. Um, so this speeds up the production of weaving <clears throat> quite dramatically. And it's for the hand loom, which he demonstrated in that video. Um, and if you dramatically improve the output of a particular weaver in terms of making cloth, that means they're gonna need a lot more yarn. And so the demand for yarn skyrockets as John Kay's uh, flying shuttle begins to be implemented and the flying shuttle, <clears throat> um, there's not much to it. It's not like it's an elaborate mechanism. It's just a clever idea that fits right into the traditional hand loom that had been around since 1200 approximately. So since the 13th century sometime. And so the, uh, adoption of the flying shuttle was quite dramatic because it, it's just, it's conceptual. It's like, once you see it, it's like, I can go buy one. If I can't buy one, I can make one. You know, it's just, it's just that simple. Um, and so uh, that creates a big demand for yarn. So now the economy around textiles in England, especially, because this is where this took place, has a problem of the supply of yarn. Um, there's a constant demand for more yarn. The price of yarn is very high. And since the price of yarn, and, and of course this is just basic, basic economic supply and demand. If the demand is very high, <coughs> Uh, or if the supply is very low, the demand is very high. If the demand is very high, then people are willing to pay a high price. And if people are willing to pay a high price, 
for yarn, then it might be profitable to go into producing yarn, right? That, that makes sense. And, um, and so lots of people are now racking their brain. Okay, how can we, and, and some of these people probably were already producing yarn in the way as demonstrated in these earlier videos uh, and maybe combining together, you know, you get a bunch of people, you know, in your neighborhood and you consolidate them into a group and, and you're like the kingpin of, of your neighborhood who is bringing in all this yarn and then uh, stockpiling it and selling it off at the highest price and whatever the case may be. Um, uh, you know, that's one way of doing it, but uh, then other people say, hey, maybe there's a better way of doing it. And they start to rethink the whole process. And Lewis Paul and John Wyatt were some of these people. And so they invent uh, a roller and a flyer and bobbin system spinning machine. So the roller mechanism evidently was some kind of uh, uh, cotton gin that then also carded the, the cotton as well. So not only did it squeeze out the seeds as I showed you, but it also did the carding, which is in the videos that I pointed you to which makes the fibers parallel. And then you have to somehow get it to sort of roll around itself and create this tubular uh, slider, uh, slidal um, uh, structure. And that's where the flyer and bobbin system uh, comes into play is like wrapping it up and creating it into uh, this tubular structure. And, um, and it's, they had some success. And, and I have some videos here that you can look at that show a mechanical cotton roller that's very basic in an Indian uh, small town. You know, it's a very basic hand crank uh, system, uh, but you can see, okay, conceptualize, okay, what that is. And then uh, the second video is a, a bobbin flywheel on a spinning wheel which is very common for um, more modern spinning wheels. Uh, but it's not, those, this is not the kind of spinning wheel that was used at the time, but this bobbin and flywheel was something that, that Lewis, uh, that Paul and Wyatt were experimenting with. Um, And so they, they have this kind of system for creating the, the basic structure of the, the, uh, of, the, of the raw product needed to make yarn and maybe even completing it into spun fashion within one machine. It's unclear exactly what their mechanism looked like. Okay. I haven't seen a good description of that. Um, and I, I, I'm suspecting that there's not very good documentation on that. <clears throat> but they do open the upper priory cotton mill and they use their mechanism and they use a couple of donkeys, you know, walking around in a circle to turn a shaft and then they, using gears and shafts and, and uh, you know, some sort of gearing mechanism, they get that to run their machine and they think this is gonna work. Uh, now, uh, evidently the, the business didn't go that well because by 1743, Wyatt is in prison for debt. That means he is severely in debt. And at this stage of the game, when people were severely in debt, they would be imprisoned. And, until they could pay off the debt. You know, not the greatest system for actually getting debts restored, but uh, this is the punitive sort of way of thinking uh, at the time. But why it is one of these people that evidently was able to get somebody to pay off his debts and he did get out of prison uh, because he does um, go on to do more work. 
uh, and we'll see him, I believe, in this outline a little later. Uh, Edward Cave, okay, this is a new person, establishes Marvel's Mill, um, which was uh, Merowin's mill before that, and it was a grist mill, which means it, it created uh, flour, basically. Um, and so this would be where you would take in wheat, and then there would be a grinding stone, and you would have like a couple of donkeys or this is actually a water wheel, okay? And so this is significant, is that you'd have a, a, a river running past, the water wheel would catch the water and turn, and that would turn a shaft, and then you would use a gearing mechanism to turn a grinding stone, whether it actually be two stone, like a, a flat stone and then a circular stone rolling around, and you'd throw the wheat in there, and it would grind it into a flower, um, and this is a kind of service that we that would be provided for all sorts of uh, farms all over the countryside. Would come to the grist mill, and then you would grind their wheat into flour, and then give it back to them. It was a service uh, industry going back to the 13th century. Okay, so this particular location had existed as that, but Edward Cave modifies it into a water powered. Uh, cotton mill using uh, using some of the technology of Hall and Wyatt, and um, and again the the details are not exactly clear. But he had two hundred fifty spindles. That's that's starting to get pretty big. This is starting to look like a factory. This isn't just a workshop. This is like a factory. Okay, and uh, but un evidently he was not able to make very good profits and it eventually went out of business. Okay, so these are a couple of, of failures, but that's sort of the nature of capitalism is that um, there has to be somebody who takes the risk in the first place, experiments, and, and often they fail, you know, 90 in the United States uh, throughout the 20th century. I don't know what it's like now, it's probably worse. But in the 20th century, um, you know, 90% of small businesses went out of business when, within the five, first five years. And so, you know, some of those are businesses that are just on paper. So that takes a big percentage. But nonetheless, even for serious businesses, the odds are not good that you're going to come out of it with a successful business. So, um, so these early failures are not. Um, are not unexpected, that's just par for the course. That's just part of the process. And then people who come along later, uh, especially maybe people that have more money to you know, see how they did and then, and then just plan for like double that time, you know, then they're closer to being successful and you just keep extending that out and eventually you get something that works. Um, Daniel Bourne did something similar along the lines of Paul and Wyatt using that same sort of technology. Uh, it seems to have been profitable, but then burned down. Okay, so this is an issue with uh, cotton mills as they often burn down. Um, in this story, uh, uh, that's just uh, the nature of, of the infrastructure at the time. There weren't fire departments for, for one thing, okay? Uh, okay, so Paul and Wyatt then, so here we see that Wyatt's out of prison. Okay, uh, Paul and Wyatt partner with uh, Samuel Touche um, to reopen that, that same mill, the, the uh, uh, Miracle Mill, as they call it, um, Marvel's Mill. So they reopen Marvel's Mill and um, and it stays open for 11 years, okay? So it seems like something was going right. And um, we know that Touche becomes quite wealthy in the 1750s, uh, but he has a diversity of investments. This isn't his only business. You know, Paul and Wyatt seem to be pretty small time and attached to this particular operation. Touche is an investor. 
Maybe he made money off of this mill operation. Maybe that was a loss, but he made money someplace else. You know, who knows? Um, so Paul, and this is the same Paul, and Born, which is the same Born, um, separately, not working together. They both patent uh, uh, must have been significantly different carding machines. So they're really trying to work out this carding process. And maybe that was the big hang up with the Paul Wyatt system is that the carding wasn't quite uh, sufficiently, uh, or quite sufficient to make quality yarn. So the, the carding is very important. You have to get those fibers brushed into a parallel pattern in order to create high quality yarn. So they're trying to work that out. Um, now, Balcasson, he's the guy that created the uh, Android waiters. Evidently, he created what is sometimes described as a fully automated silk loom, which sounds highly unlikely, but it, at least it allegedly is highly automated. Um, a silk loom, and this is in France, where the motivation of the community is not uh, large, you know, the motivation is not strong to automate this process. Um, so there's a lot of protectionism of the traditional silk manufacturer. <clears throat> so maybe he did successfully do that, but people just didn't adopt it. And there is some indication that, you know, he has kind of run out of town by, by the traditional silk manufacturers. Um, but uh, this does seem a little suspicious um, because Valcanson was caught um, uh, creating hoax where he had a, a demo uh, mechanism that appeared to work in one way, but really he had, you know, it was really just an illusion. It wasn't really a functioning machine. It just appeared to work in a certain way. And he was just uh, sort of creating devices for entertainment. Um, so I don't, I don't know, that's, that's a little suspicious. It doesn't quite fit uh, within the history here, uh, but it would be interesting to find out exactly what's going on there. Okay, um, Richard Arkwright, now he's gonna be very significant in this whole story. Uh, in 1784, he is experimenting with a carding machine. So evidently carding is kind of a big stumbling block for the automation of spinning yarn. And uh, it seems like such a simple thing, but then when you see the way that it's done by hand, it is a quite involved process and requires, you know, uh, a certain intuitive feel for the way that the combing process works. So uh, I can see how it would, it might take quite a, a bit of trial and error to work it out. But Richard R. Reich is working on that. Um, Paul and Born separately are also, so you have these three inventors that are uh, you know, really know what they're doing because they're, they're central to this whole story, uh, but they're having trouble working out this carding process. Okay, so um, uh, Robert Parsley Peel. Okay, and I think I just wanna wrap up this video with this. The, Robert Parsley Peel now is, is one of our, is maybe in some ways from a Marxist perspective, um, he's the most imp important person that we've come to so far. So that's one thing about the way that the industrial revolution is normally presented is that there's all this focus on the machines and and the mechanisms and the money and 
and uh, progress and sort of glorifying these geniuses um, of science, you know, but they're not really scientists, they're technologists, they're engineers, you know, there's a clear distinction between engineers and scientists, uh, you know, Isaac Newton is a scientist, uh, you know, Richard Artwright is an engineer, and we want to keep that distinction in our mind. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and I've made some comments in that regard, but let's leave that at that. I, mean, I have more to say about that, but that's for a different course. Um, philosophy of science, okay. But, um, but in relationship to uh, Marx's perspective of the revolu revolutionary process that is taking place here and the class warfare that's involved that I've already hinted out, uh, Robert Parsley Peel is our main character, our main character up to this point, uh, because he is one of these yeoman farmers that I've mentioned before, and uh, this is a, a commoner. The, he owns some land. He's fairly well established. But he's, he and his family for generations have been well established, but are also struggling. They're not at the absolute bottom, but they're not even middle class. They're part of the commoners. And um, especially from the perspective of feudalism, you know, their absolute bottom, okay. But Robert Parsley um, comes from a family of yeoman farmers, and these are guys that are experimenting, you know, and they have a sort of naive belief in English nationalism and the can do spirit. And this is where a lot of the military, um, uh, you know, quasi professional military comes from. And, um, and Robert Parsley Peel's grandfather had experimented with calico printing. And so uh, Parsley Peel, he has these block prints in his, in his barn that his grandfather had experimented with. But of course, uh, he grew up in a family of farmers. His father was a farmer and, and they're trying to make the, the farm work, but um, little by little, he starts to, uh, well, really what happens is his brother-in-law, Jonathan uh, Hayworth, uh, goes off to some sort of apprenticeship and learns calico printing, and then comes back home, or comes to live uh, in the area of, of uh, Parsley Peel, and, and they start talking and they say, hey, why don't we try doing some calico printing on our own. You know, I have a big barn. Let's, let's buy some equipment. Let's, let's start printing some calico. We'll see what happens. And, and, uh, and then we have William Yates. He's a pub owner, evidently, you know, some sort of social connection there. And he financially backs them. And they open up a calico printing shop. And Peel, uh, maybe by accident experiments with some pewter, um, which is a kind of metal that is used in, on, in plates and uh, the classic sort of silver beer mug that you see in English stories. Like my daughter watches Beauty and the Beast and they're, they're singing songs and they're swinging their mugs of beer that are silver. Those are, those are pewter mugs. Um, so it, it's that kind of thing. This is the the time period that we're talking about. And um, he uses that metal to start doing calico printing. And uh, at the suggestion of his daughter, uses a parsley leaf as a, as a, as a pattern, as, as a, a design motif. And, um, and that's where the name parsley comes from. You know, this is his nickname, parsley, because uh, then this parsley insignia becomes sort of a signature in his calico designs. Okay. So evidently he has 
some creativity and and uh, comes up with some kind of calico printing process that's unique. And, and it may be to do with the pewter or maybe that is just a, a screen for something more technical that he was doing. Um, but there seems to be some sort of uh, inspirational moment here. <clears throat> uh, so we, so this, um, this Hawthorne Peel and Yates textile company becomes a going concern. Now this is again on the level of burger production where uh, Peel is, you know, has suppliers that are weavers that are using hand looms and using the flying shuttle to create cloth and um, calico cloth is actually is actually the the cheapest kind of cloth or one of the cheapest kind of cloths to make because it doesn't need high quality yarn. Uh, it can be clumpy. It doesn't need to be of highest quality, and it doesn't need to be pure white because then what they do is they they print the entire thing with a bright color. And then they print a bright design on top of it. So there's there's a ton of dye laid on top of it. So the original fabric is not as much of a concern as the way the the design that's printed upon it. And so the the fabric is more of a, a more of a rough canvas on which to print the design. Um, and uh, one of, and so, you know, Peel would have suppliers really that are independent contractors that are working out of their homes with their kid and, and their wife. And, you know, maybe the lady next door is spending extra yarn because they're using the flying shuttle because, and so they need more yarn, more yarn. Um, and, and then Peel is buying these at wholesale from his weaver suppliers who are small businessmen like himself, but maybe he's a little, he's at a little bit bigger level in terms of capital, but not higher class. And, um, uh, you know, and then he's printing these out and then he has some sort of warehouse, which is a little more sophisticated. And then he's selling off these bolts of fabric. Um, to other manufacturers that are then converting this into clothing or draperies or things like that. <clears throat> okay. So James Hargraves is one of Peel's weavers, like one of his suppliers. And um, Hargraves and Peel began to experiment with a carding machine. Okay, so this carding machine, you know, People are thinking there's something here. It's like, if you could just figure out this part of it, it's gonna make everything click. Um, and, um, and so they, they get a carding machine and maybe modify it and they're trying to make it work, but evidently they, they abandoned that project at some point. Okay. Um, and, at the same time, there's John Kay. Now this is a different John Kay from what we saw before with the, um, the flying shuttle. This is one John Kay, there's a different John Kay down here. Okay, so, and this John Kay is gonna come up later on. Uh, and John, Thomas Hayes, they experiment with uh, the Paul Wyatt roller system, you know, bobbin, flyer, uh, bobbin and flyer system, trying to make this yarn automation uh, work. Um, but, um, but they're still just in this experimental phase. But now these guys are gonna be main players. James Hargreaves, Parsley Peel, and John Kay uh, are, are gonna be guys that, that have major uh, breakthroughs and significance uh, for this longer story. All right, so I'm gonna leave it right there for this video and then I'll pick up with the story in the next video.